This episode 005 covers the inspection of an ICO model 443 transistor curve tracer. This piece of equipment, besides having the usual hazards of 120 volt AC line voltage, can generate peak to peak AC voltages in excess of 1400 volts and needs to be handled with the proper safety practices. As these voltages can shock, injure, or possibly kill if not treated with the proper respect and procedures. Please work safely and carefully if you do work on one of these devices. Hello and welcome to episode 005 of Poor Man's Electronics Bench. Today we are going to be doing a inspection and a survey for a recap on a ICO 443 solid state semiconductor curve tracer. I managed to get this off of our favorite auction site at a reasonable price and I am kind of interested in curve tracers to be able to test transistors because I'll probably be needing them going down the line to work on some audio gear that I have. This particular one has uh, some interesting functions. It has the capability of testing diodes and not only testing diodes, it has uh, inputs for them. It has a capability of applying up to 2,000 peak inverse volts on a diode to check its breakdown and also to be able to run at higher voltages to check zeners for their forward and reverse breakdowns in case you have a zener that you don't know what the uh, breakdown voltage is uh, for the reverse breakdown you can actually use this to check it out I'm not sure what its drive range is on uh, for testing capacitors and a manual said something about 400 volts but this has some uh, settings on it that lead you to believe it runs at some higher voltages it, it has on the front panel here it's got a volts per division going up to 200 volts per volts per division applied to the component under test so that would lead you to believe that it could run a 2000 volt test on a lot of things uh, it has a selectable current, selectable power, and uh, it also came comes built in with a, this is probably a TO3 package uh, test jig where you can just insert a TO3 into there, hold it down. This would connect to the outside of the device, probably, I forget what that is, if it's the collector or emitter and uh, it just makes it speedy for testing TO3s. It has sockets for smaller transistors plus it has banana jacks to be able to connect to external cords. These testers mostly are going to be out of circuit testers to work properly but it's, uh, it's got some interesting features uh, but the one thing about it is it was auctioned as a it was auctioned as a for parts uh, for parts only but the seller insured me. He was he was actually reselling it for somebody else, and he insured me it should be it is functional. So I'd at least like to check out the major components in it: the, the power transformer, the high voltage transformer, and make sure and just make sure there's no general damage in it uh, going forward. I'm hopefully, if, if as long as nothing's cracked or broken, I can repair anything else that's in, inside going on. Uh, one of the first things to do from anything you get from eBay is do a general inspection. Make sure none of the knobs are bent. You might find stuff. This one's got a missing cap to it. That's not a deal breaker. Other than that, it's in really nice shape. No dents. No dings. One of the first things I found to do, though, is do a take it and do a vigorous shake test. See if there is anything loose inside the unit. And... I'll go over this in a bit. Uh, another thing is to, until you do a uh, good internal inspection, resist the urge to activate, uh, exercise any rotary component switches or potentiometers because you want to see if there's damage done for any reason to those components before you actually manipulate them since this is, this is now your item. Uh, 
if you can get a chance to inspect something before it transfers ownership, you'd have the owner turn the knobs. If he breaks it, then it's still his. <laughs> so he can't argue that point, and he's the one to turn the knobs. Um, but uh, once you get it in your possession, it's going to be something that you need to pay attention to the fact that if you go forward and <coughs> manipulate something that is cracked or broken on the inside and does more damage, it's, that's on you. So I know they tell you, oh, turn this. Some of the guys tell you, oh, turn this, make sure this works okay. Once you own it, you want to make sure things going forward are are in good shape uh, and that you won't do any damage going forward on them so I did a quick inspection on the power cord it's a three prong cord and it seems to be in good shape there's no no cracking on the insulation anywhere the plug end is got a really nice molding going into the plastic still so we're not going to not going to sweat that being an issue I can't see any any visible conductors anywhere uh looks to be an early model this is actually looks like it's got the factory tag on it and it says serial number 83 so it's an early early run this has uh looked at the schematic it has two transformers in it one's a lower for lower voltage and one one apparently has up to 2000 volts on it ac that's used for the diode check function and i'm sure to drive the transistors as well so we're going to take our bottom off and see what we have in store this does also have outputs for the oscilloscope on the bottom and a fuse I'll check out the condition of the fuse in a little bit but it's a nice unit and uh, I guess as far as functionality, I won't be able to know what's going on until I actually apply it to doing its service. I do have a leader transistor curve tracer in my position that is in working condition, although it probably should get a recap as well. Anything, any test equipment that I get, especially if it's older than 40 years old, which this one has definitely been out since the early 70s, not the late 60s. I'm planning on just doing a shotgun recap on it. There's, as far as the electrolytics, there's no reason not to. The way I look at it, I'm I, I want things if I'm going to be using them to be reliable. Since I'm going to be using this to working on something else, I don't want something else. I don't want a device I'm using in the process of using to troubleshoot something else to fail while I'm working on something else. It would be pretty damn ridiculous. So. <clears throat> so we're going to see what kind of goodness this has. This has no contents of anything remarkable inside the bottom, which is really good. There's a little bit of a little bit of dust and grit. Probably one of the cleaner used units of anything I've I've opened up. <clears throat> we have some fun looking goodness in here. We have a rheostat for one function that looks to be in really nice shape. I don't see any breaks in the winding on it at all. Let's take a zoom in on that. That looks to be in really nice shape. I'm going to take a very close look at all the switch mechanisms and make sure that nothing looks like it's loose or broken these are some higher quality switches they have covers on part of the contact areas which is really nice uh, these look like single deck but they have some sort of function where they have uh, blank decks or poles that they put it says on the schematic that a couple of the switches have uh, have a blank blank deck or pole uh, that they uh, had made with the switch just to use it as a, uh, a soldering terminal strip for our components so and we have another 
one here. This one looks a little suspiciously weird, like it's had some arcy. No, might be a bad shadow. Well, it's got a little, little dirt or something in there. That one contact. Let's zoom in a little. Looks like this one here has a little dirty spot or something. Doesn't look like any severe arcing, nothing's melted or burned. I'll have to do a little bit of a closer inspection on the layers underneath it. Right, get me some auxiliary lighting here. Don't see anything obvious that's cracked, bent, or broken, which is really good. Next switch down the line here, that's all enclosed, and don't see anything burnt or arcing on that one. The potentiometer seems to be in good shape, and I don't think I don't think Ico offer these in kit form. I think these are all factory. Excuse me. Ah, let's see. Terminal strips mounted solidly. Got. Hmm. We've got wiring for. I have to look at what's uh. Let's switch that is. This wiring here is a little strange. It's going to the transformer. I've got a spot. Well, no, it's got had a little wax that dripped off the transformer and the, the wax cracked that looked it was really looks really weird. Let me let me show it to you here. It looks like the wax cracked, but there's no crack in the insulation underneath. It's just strange strange looking goings on there. Zoom in here. Oh, careful. <laughs> it looks like that one spot bent up a little bit on that black wire, it, but it had some wax on it that precipitated from that transformer over the years, which is kind of weird considering that. Right now it's in an upside down position. I don't know how wax would have got at it, but maybe from maybe from the uh, the cloth covered wiring, it looks like that's waxed a little. So, other than that, it's uh, I can give you a little a little closer tour to things here. It looks like it's in really nice shape. I can't see any real evidence of anybody being in here. It's got. Doesn't, and the nice part about this one particular piece of equipment is it does not have a high amount of capacitors in it. It has a small board here with a few on it. And uh, I might go over them with an ESR meter and see how, what, they're, what they measure. So I can ESR them in, in circuit with it powered down. And if they measure an unacceptable value, I'm going to, my next thing would be to plug in the unit through a current limiting dim bulb device and then try to uh, check voltages on it. So my main concern on anything is that the capacitors are going to wear out, short out, and cause a catastrophic failure for anything. Even though it's fused, you never know what could happen and if you if you own it if you'd like to keep it working my thoughts are why take the chance it's just got a little bit of oxidation on some stuff but other than that it, it looks like it's in really nice shape so so far it looks like I've gotten lucky in this one uh, going to Try to get some leads that will clip onto the capacitors a little better. So I'll be back in a minute just so I can do a quick ESR test on them. So I'll be back. Okay, I am back with the low 
fairly low budget but also fairly accurate ESR meter. And for these particular leads, they I haven't calibrated it, so we shall do that now. Good enough. Okay. And there's some pretty small leads here. Oh boy, come on. You have to try to get this one on in a way that doesn't short it against the case as well. So 034 on the one. <clears throat> this other one's a toughie. It's uh it's got a blind termination and I have to see if I can go fishing for it. If not then might have to take that board loose. The 300 micro with 25 volts. <clears throat> and, you know, the funny thing about these ESR meters is they are Mark this a positive and negative, but you have to realize that the device is running at an alternating current frequency. So that alternating current frequency really does not care what the polarity is going to be when you hook it up. It does not care about any, as long as it's, uh, oh, that one's over a little bit. I gotta try to fish around for this thing here. Or try a different angle. And move the meter out of the way. Well, whoever put this in here really didn't want you to be able to access the leads in it. I'm going to think that I made contact with something that comes up at a point zero five eight. So. The only other thing I probably should do is check them for DC resistance as well. Now what I think I'm going to take a minute off camera to loosen up that board and pull it out to have better access. I shall return. Okay, uh, we have the board out. Not out, but uh, I've got the hardware loosened to it. It's only looks like it's only these two two hardware studs. I think some fairly nice engineering went into this. There's appears to be slack in all the wires that go to the board, so there was some forethought as far as being able to maintain things going into the future. I have a star washer here. I need to. Uh, Magnetized screwdriver always helps you get hardware off. There we go. Everything looks factory down to the original soldering at it. It's really nicely well made board. Uh, and now I can get access to my capacitor bead. But that was problematic. Boy, that was tight. I, I'm not sure if I was making contact with it or not. Uh, 0.053, so 
the only other thing I'd like to do is to check the actual DC resistance on them because uh, ESR is one thing, that's basically a capacitive impedance but we want to make sure that our resistance is a value or it's not causing a short circuit if I put the meter on and it uh, should show the capacitor taking a charge to show that it's functional things on an ohmmeter and look for oh we'll see like 4k negative is the far end from me facing the board I'm hoping the polarity of this meter is correct but I don't think it'll matter that much I can always reverse it too Hmm. Okay, on the on the four meg range, the meter shows it is behaving like a capacitor. It's slowly taking a charge. I'm not sure if the polar if the polarity is going to make a difference. What I'll do is I'll reverse it quick. Shows a dead short, so I'm I'm thinking the meter leads are marked not a dead short, but a three three kilo ohm short. So I'm thinking that the meter leads are correct as far as polarity being applied to the capacitor. And because if you normally if you reverse polarity in an electrolytic, it will start conducting, it will show leakage, it will start start conducting current, heat up, and usually catastrophically fail. So <laughs> it looks like. Like what we have for a common black. Yeah, it looks like that it looks like the capacitor just took a charge quick and has a low amount of DC leakage as well, so that's a good sign. our connecting to the other capacitor out of the two that one the positive is marked on my left so I'll have to these axials are actually larger than the spots and the traces are accounting for the good thing about that is if I replace them I have space to replace them with a radial or an axial radial will probably be cheaper and also I have the height as well and radi uh, radial will be cheaper and it will fit better so yeah that one's got a 370k ohm resistance and the proper polarity k in the reverse polarity Now this is not a non-polarized. Let me make sure I've got the leads in the right spots here. You know what? I think I was clipped on the transistor next to it. I did not. Okay. <laughs> this shows the positive end. And putting a lower <coughs> uh, measurement range on the meter it shows that the capacitor is behaving like a capacitor it is going up in value to, with the DC charge which is what we'd like to see I'm going to reverse it and it's almost a dead short and reverse polarity no, 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 well, not the dead short per se, but it's that's four kilo ohms solid under reverse polarity. So that means that it's behaving like you know, an electrolytic capacitor should. 
that's functioning well. Uh, the only other couple things I'd like to do before I think about applying power to this is to take uh, measurement readings on the transformers. I have to look up on the schematic quick. I'll go over the schematic with you in a second to try to figure out which transformer and which leads are which. <clears throat> okay, I have the schematic that I found online. Uh, one thing about buying any electronics equipment in general, if you have a chance, look for as much information about the device that you're looking to buy beforehand. Uh, it could make life a lot easier for you to do any type of repair work or future maintenance, getting parts, uh, just and, and how it functions. Because it's if you buy something that you can't find information for you, you almost have to reverse engineer it sometimes to figure out what's going on with it. So this one, there there were quite a few sources for a uh, full owner's manual that had parts list and a schematic on it. So it's kind of nice. So going over things, some of the specifications on it, the diode and rectifier ranges, shows a peak inver inverse voltage ranges up to 2,000 volts maximum. I haven't seen any other curve tracer besides a... Uh, full-blown Tektronics that has any type of uh, functionality up to that voltage. And uh, just goes over the type of uh, type of connections, the oscilloscope requirements. This is a late 60s, early 70s, so it's not demanding for the oscilloscope. In fact, I think with this unit it states it actually gave you a uh, transparent radical uh, 10 by 10 grid to put on top of your screen to uh, be able to calibrate the unit and read it properly on an older oscilloscope. Uh, 117 volts in, 11 watts power usage, so very low power usage. Uh, let's see here, this is a uh, VTVM calibration, any, any type of VTVM would probably do. Uh, the oscilloscope connections to a general purpose oscilloscope goes over your calibrations for your diodes and capacitor <coughs> no, diodes and transistor uses it shows you some type of some types of the screens you should get as you're going through measuring the testing components and then the schematic is must have been a larger page because it's sectioned off into three sections this uh, this middle one has the two transformers on it there's a should be a T1 and a T2. They're in the parts list. <clears throat> oh boy, where are they? I saw them. There oh, they are. And T1 is a 6.3 volt 1 amp. For the, I guess for the general, general circuitry power. And then for the drive, the 1000 volt AC. So peak to peak, it's going to be 20 possibly get to 2800 volts. <clears throat> uh, 5.56 is the transformer. I don't see... I'll have to do a little bit of wiring tracing to figure out which one is which, but you know, whichever one has the AC leads... Uh, well, they both are both going to have AC leads going to them. According to the schematic, I believe. Secondary and T2 primary is going to go up to possibly S7 on the one side. The other side it has actually has a lead paralleled to T1. Paralleled or series? Could be series. Oh. <laughs> Interesting. I have to look into that. Well, the secondary here on the high voltage on T2 goes uh, to a connection off of the switch, but also goes to a, a voltage divider, a switched voltage divider network here. So if I look for something that's Probably a one deck. 
with some resistors on it, that would probably be easier to find. I'm looking for 2 watt, 2 watt, 1 watt, 1 watt, 105k, 105k. Five hundred ohm, five hundred forty ohm. That's not it. I don't see. Hmm. Well, it shows three diodes. I see three diodes here, so there's a good chance that this could be it. Try to see if one of my transformer leads are heading in that direction. Flashlight. Thinking there's a good chance this is the secondary here because one uh, function that they have is there's a push button momentary contact diode test switch and what that does is it in, towards the bottom of the chassis. I'll show you the picture. I'll show you show you it on the on a video later. What that does is it gives the ability to. not electrocute yourself by making you take one hand off of any connections and hold that switch down. There's a rheostat involved with the one transistor or one transformer. Kind of looking for a rheostat. Uh, it's the larger rheostat of the bunch. This is one of those things I've seen. Seen a few people on YouTube. They're looking for something on a schematic. They can't find it, and probably a hundred users pick it out within two seconds of seeing the schematic come up. <laughs> it's just the way it works. Uh, here we go, the 2.5 ohm, 2.5 K, and it looks like it's close to the 7 volt AC source going through a capacitor, so I'm thinking that's not the one. Well, what I'll do is I'll just check out some resistance values in the transformer leads themselves. I'll, uh, one side's got to be the primary, so those will be tied tied together to the 117 line, and then I'll just have to follow things through. So I'm going to switch back to the video. The view of the device itself while I'm doing that, just to uh, just so you can see what's going on while I'm looking at the uh, schematic, so be back in a minute. Okay, we're back to, to the device view, and I'm going to prop up the meter to get some glare off of it here. I think what I'm just going to try to do is to figure out which transformer is which by checking out the secondary windings. I wish I hooked some fish as well as I hooked that wire. <clears throat> okay. This side here. Oh, let's, let me check the continuity on the fuse too. Look.
Looks like it had a properly valued fuse in it. I don't know if it was blown or not. I'm going to see that our fuse is exhibiting... Oh no, 0.7 ohms. Looks good. Check the leads here again. Got the short there. Okay. <clears throat> The one thing about this schematic is it leaves a little bit to be desired because it would be nice if it showed the, well, you've got same colors on both transformers, but <clears throat> it would be nice if they showed colors on some things, wires, stuff. <clears throat> okay, that one's got an 86.7. I'm going to say that's the primary side. Oh, come on. <clears throat> Zero point five ohms, that doesn't sound like a high voltage winding, that sounds like a low voltage secondary, six point three. I'm going to try the secondary on this transformer. Three point seven five. If you can see the <coughs> the lead connection on the switch deck, they both go to the. secondary on that transformer, so I am thinking that those two points are going to be the test points for the high voltage. <clears throat> and so this little switch I was talking about before, can't really see it well in that view, I can angle down a little. On the front panel, that one is marked as a uh, diode test, so you cannot do the diode test unless you press that switch. It looks like that switch is going to supply primary voltage to that transformer, and it won't function until, until you do so. black wire traces around to the rheostat thirty three ohms sounds like an AC winding uh, primary winding but I'll check it against this one again also, I can check and see if these are in series. That one's at 86 ohms. And it looks like I was right because there was a very low resistance continuity connection between one of the terminal leads on this transformer on that terminal strip and the winding here, so there must be a direct continuity that puts those two transformers in series. So, interesting configuration, but it doesn't look like anything's a dead short, which is very good, and it doesn't look like uh, any of the windings are also open. They've got some sort of continuity, and they are also values that you would expect on a transformer that's uh, that's in good condition so going to at this point I'm just going to go through and make some measurements as far as uh, what capacitors I need to replace make some notes and measurements because uh, I'd like to do that before I reassemble things back together apply some voltage to it and just check the uh, 
check the output voltages on these transformers. Part of the measurement process, or uh, the survey process for things, the uh, parts list only shows six capacitors total. One is a Mylar 0.47. Another one's a Mylar 0.22. Oh, there's two Mylar 0.27s. Another one's a Mylar 0.22. And then there are two 300 microfarad at 6 volt capacitors and one 2 microfarad at 160. I'll kind of survey around and see if I can locate everybody. This white one shows a C2, so barring it, uh, barring it being defective, there should also be a, it should have a twin because there's supposed to be two of them. Interesting that I can't find it, but... <laughs> Must be a C4 here somewhere. Unfortunately, that uh, the ICO uh, manual does not give a parts location layout. Not going to worry about those too much. Uh, no, I'll check them under test just to see how they behave. Odds are they're odds are they're in good shape. Uh, the capacitors that I am interested in are the. There's two electrolytics there and one there, and there's also supposed to be two that are two of the same values for 300 microfarad at 6 volts. I'm not seeing it. And not only that, I'm not sure what that value is. That is capacitor C5. C5 is the 300. So this is a 300 at 6. It shows that there's supposed to be two of them in this device. Well, guess what? It's not accurate. Uh, I have a 5 microfarad. <clears throat> uh, I'm thinking this is a point, no, this is a point 0.5 microfarad. That's the point 0.47, that is C, C2. That must be C4. They have apparently uh, used a different type of capacitor. The polyfoil or something, so check that one out. I'll probably end up, could end up replacing that one. This one's more likely to be suspect than this one. Right now I am only seeing I'm not I'm only seeing one three hundred microfarad to twenty five which is overrated the parts list calls for six volts and the other capacitor I can't really see the value on it but it's supposed to be C five so these are supposed to be twins. <laughs> Oh no, C3, yeah, C3 and C5, these are supposed to be twins, so apparently I can, I can either, I have a choice to make, I can either substitute the same value that I found on the unit, or substitute what's on the schematic. <laughs> uh, the, the 300 microfarad value sounds right, 25 volts, I figure if they were 
underrated. They wouldn't have survived the test of time as well as they have. So probably go with that. So uh, what I'll do is I'll make a note of try to track things in a spreadsheet. Make a note of what my capacitors are. Okay, I spent a little time looking at the schematic and the uh, the parts list and inside the device and there is an electrolytic capacitor listed for C1 of a 2 microfarad value at 160 volts and I cannot find it in this device. It looks on the schematic, it looks like it is placed in parallel with uh, indicator light, power indicator light and uh, it's I'm, I'm looking around the circuitry for both power indicator lights and there is no no such capacitor of that value anywhere anywhere in the area I can see oh well uh, wait a second there might be I see a point zero two two at two fifty right here. Looks to be some sort of foil capacitor. That might be one of the other ones I'm missing. Uh, that one's going to be left in place. But I can't see. Well, I, it's one of those things. I can't tell if that. It says C, and the, the funny part about it is this, if, if this this schematic in the parts list, <laughs> the schematic may say, uh, or the parts list might say C1, but I've seen that items that are on the schematic are marked, if it's the first item, it's just marked as the item type. It doesn't have a <laughs> numerical value after it. It's like T1 just says T. C just says two. <laughs> I can't see a decimal place in front of it. <laughs> there are other items I can show you. I'll bounce back to the schematic a little bit to show you. It's kind of comical, but uh, it's it's kind of hard to tell a value, tell tell what item you're looking at when you don't see a don't see a properly marked item number on it. Uh, Another thing is, is I'm not seeing stuff with decimal places on the schematic. So I'm not even sure if that's the case because like on uh, <coughs> here we've got a Mylar, one Mylar point zero two two clearly has a decimal place on it. So C1 might be an item that was deemed not necessary because it's it's in a circuit it just has a dropping resistor for the neon light actually and actually two two dropping resistors in the diode it might have been uh, deemed not necessary once they put it in the manufacturer or as they used to say on my old job uh, omitted for clarity <laughs> whatever that meant I don't know because it's I'll get into that some other time, <laughs> but there's, that stuff happens, I guess, throughout anything to do with uh, electronics and schematics or uh, work, work prints. Uh, so, not going to worry about that. <coughs> Excuse me. Not going to worry about that one, so I'm just going to concern myself with the <coughs> items that we need to order. And I've been making a spreadsheet to track... Things. I did some research on some transistors in case they burned out on what might need to be ordered on this and also I might as well keep track of my transistors that I uh, my capacitors that I need and 
<clears throat> oh, I've got one here. What hell? Okay, there we go. Uh, I'm just going to measure out the actual length and I'm going to do it in millimeters because every when you go to order stuff, everything's in millimeters. So the lead spacing on these guys. That's a 32 millimeter. The lead spacing on both of them is a 32 millimeter on the board, so should be able to accommodate about anything I need for using radials. And then the diameter is a 13.21, so about a half inch. And this board looks to have, I'm trying not to move around too much, but it looks to have some adequate spacing on it. Where half inch wouldn't be a wouldn't be a stretch to get it into things. Boy, I well production line you're only going to get so much out of them, but it's nice as a technician to replace things to put the values up in a visible spot. It just makes sense and some shows the quality of work that some technicians do. Uh, my my old job, it was always try to do the best job you can because the next person might need that information and a lot of times I was the next person so <laughs> people just don't uh, people just don't care about some stuff sometimes and the only other thing I'd like to like to show is just doing a little looking around in here and found a really neat thing about the function on this on this rheostat it has a little spring loaded arm for the contact that that just shows some quality because everything else that you see would be probably just a wiper arm without any without any real thought for longevity to it and keeping a constant pressure on it that that just shows some quality in the way things used to be built compared to compared to the mindset of if it breaks just throw it out and buy a new one that we have today so i'm going to Put that board back on and I'm going to set up to do some voltage measurements. One of them is going to be a, since it's up to 2000 peak volts, one of them is, these two terminals is going to involve a high voltage probe. So I'll go over that in a minute. Due to the amount of time I am putting into this labor of love, I am breaking this episode up into multiple parts. Part 2 will feature a bonus device that you will have to view to find out about. This content is available on YouTube and Odyssey.com. If you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe. Hope you return soon.